coming. I really appreciate it on such short notice. For any of you expecting to hear a discussion on patent issues um, today, I assure you that um, you know, the panelists would probably be willing to wing it. But unfortunately, this, this event today is on um, the internet and how um, local and state uh, entities look at the internet and the upcoming convergence issues. Um, we did have a patent hearing scheduled for today, or patent event scheduled for today, but unfortunately the, the House Judiciary Committee scheduled uh, the same subject at this particular time um, and took all of our panelists. So we had this in the can and we decided to pull the trigger on it. So thank you all for coming. It's really appreciated. I'm Tim Lorden with the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee and we try to put together fair and balanced uh, discussions on these issues and we thought we put together a four-person panel, which is our uh, our standard operating procedure uh, to look at uh, this important issue. For our moderator today, we've enlisted um, a board member of the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, one of the founding board members of this organization, um, which is committed to um, non-advocacy, not supporting any particular legislative um, prescription. His name is Roger Cachetti, and he's going to be a moderator today, and I just want to briefly introduce him. He's Group Director for U.S. Public Policy for CompTIA. Um, before that, he worked at VeriSign. Um, the, you've probably heard of that company, and before that at IBM um, where he joined the Internet Education Foundation's board, my board, um, he has been around these issues for many, many years. Um, before that he was at ComSat. Um, he has basically been at the forefront um, since there was an Internet. So I'd like to introduce Roger Cachetti, our moderator. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here, and I was delighted to have an opportunity to, to uh, participate um, in this panel, in part because for those who have followed the evolution of the Internet um, since even before it was called the Internet to the time it was the NSFnet or the DARPA net, the, role of, the issue of the role of states and cities has been an important issue. This is nothing new, and, and it's only recently come, to the, come uh, to the fore, and as Tim, I think, implied, as technologies converge, it's becoming a compelling issue that we're all going to have to deal with. But it's not widely known that um, uh, the, before there was an internet, back when there was a DARPA net, there, the state governments were actually quite involved in the formation of this DARPA net through the state university system. And when there was an NSF net, before there was an internet, many state governments were a particip active participants in the NSF net um, for communications and, and, and other activities. Uh, as the Internet has grown and as it has now emerged as a, as a force and a factor in all of our lives, in every sector of the society, in every sector of every level of government and in every aspect of our economy, it's not surprising that city and state governments who have had historic responsibilities to provide education, law enforcement, health, public health and other services for their citizens um, are becoming more deeply involved in the, in the Internet. First and, and foremost, we all know that most uh, municipal and state governments today rely on the Internet for their own operations. Uh, some state and municipal governments have gone all the way and are completely Internet-centric, but every one of them, and there's not a single state agency, I think, in the country today that, that is not an active user in the Internet and doesn't rely on the Internet to, to provide many of the services um, that it does to its citizens. But the subject of today's uh, discussion is it goes a little bit further than that, and that is the role of the state and um, cities, the states and the cities, in regulating the Internet. Um, this touches on the constitutional responsibilities of the federal um, and state governments to um, exercise um, responsibility or authority over different types of activities. We all know that um, the issue in this case is, is made more, is, is far more complicated than discussions that took place um, almost 100 years ago regarding um, jurisdiction over the telecommunications networks or, for that matter, discussions that took place 60 or 70 years ago um, on authority over broadcasting um, networks uh, or even more recently jurisdiction over cable television networks because the Internet at the end of the day is actually a network of networks and it's not a network that one party builds and owns and operates but rather it's an interconnected uh, network of networks that com that's comprised of, um, at this point, almost one million networks, that each of which have voluntarily decided to interconnect with the other 999,999 from every country, every province, every city, essentially, in the world. 
We've got four, I think, very distinguished people to uh, give us their perspective on uh, this issue, and in particular focus on some of the emerging issues which we're all going to be following in the newspapers and, and uh, in the press as they uh, become more visible. Um, our first is uh, Commissioner uh, Deborah Tate. Um, Debbie is the former assistant legal counsel uh, to um, Governor Lamar Alexander, now Senator Lamar Alexander, and um, a, a former assistant to um, Representative Don Sundquist. So she has a wealth of experience at the federal level in the Congress and the issues that come up in the Congress. Um, she is the just departed uh, chair of the Tennessee um, Regulatory Commission, and um, she now heads up the Nehruk, uh effort um, uh, in this area and will be sharing with us, I think, the perspective of, of state regulators. Um, Rick Zimmerman um, is with the National Cable Tele and Telecommunications Association. Um, he's uh, had five years experience. Recently, he was also um, with state uh, public utilities commissions. Uh, he was for five years in the staff of the Maryland and Florida um, state PUCs, and he's going to share with us the perspective of the um, of the NCTA and its members. Um, Cheryl Lianza is uh, with the National League of Cities. She recently joined the National League of Cities. Before that, she'd spent six and a half years with the Media Access Project, a a well-known public interest law firm and she's widely recognized and often quoted in the press for her comments on telecommunications regulatory issues. And last but by no means least, um, Ed Merlis with the U.S. Telecom Association um, has been with the uh, uh, USTA for um, about two years. Um, he had spent um, 13 years with the Air Transport Association but I think more uh, to the point, um, used to work in the uh, cable uh, I industry himself, and he will share with us the, the perspective of the, of the UST members. We're going to, uh, the, the way the program will uh, 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 proceed is that we're, we're going to ask each of the panelists, uh, going down from left to right uh, down the table, to offer us some introductory comments of, of um, three to five minutes. Um, I'm going to ask you to hold your questions until all the panelists have, uh, um, have finished their opening remarks. Um, the panelists who go over the, uh, the time limit are going to start to hear the uh, tap, on the, the, uh, which is a reminder, but um, I, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll keep to our time limit. After that, uh, we'll have a brief discussion among the panelists and give them an opportunity to ask each other questions. Um, and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. When you uh, ask a question from the floor, um, there's a couple of important things uh, about that. First, it is uh, important that you identify yourself, and please excuse me for cutting you off if you forget that you're supposed to identify yourself, because we need to know who you are. Um, secondly, um, statements are welcome as long as they're brief um, and followed by a question. Um, and thirdly, it is important that your question be reasonably concise, because I'm going to have to repeat your question for the purposes of the recording of this event. And if you ask a very long, complicated question, we can all be sure that I'm going to get it wrong, and then we're going to waste a lot of time going back and forth between you and me on what your question was or wasn't and waste time for the panelists. So uh, again, when question time comes, please identify yourself. Um, if you're going to make a statement, make it brief, and um, make your question simple enough so that it can be repeated and, I think, understood by everyone. Without any further delay, let me ask uh, Debbie if she would uh, begin her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And actually, I wanted to just clarify one thing. And since we're just meeting those who are introducing us, I didn't have the opportunity to work with Congressman Sunquist when he was here, but actually when he became the governor of the state. So I don't have nearly as much <laughs> knowledge about what you all do um, every day here um, as, as uh my introduction seemed to um, state, but I'm very honored to be here. I hope you all never lose the um, ability to look around a room like this and realize the history that you all are helping to make every day that you spend in this place. It's great to be able to be back here and to talk about issues that are facing us in Nashville, Tennessee, as well as you all in Washington and all around the country. I'm actually pinch-hitting for our president, Diane Munns, who was here yesterday. Many of you all 
all were at the subcommittee hearing on IP. And actually, I was going to take a little, um, I just wanted to refute the name of this panel, uh, regulation of the internet or something, and say, okay, well, my only statement is um, we don't. So I'll just move on. But, um, you know, a little more seriously, I guess one of the things that I wanted to do um, is to talk about the fact that this is, you know, much greater discussion than just about the telecommunications industry. That um, I, we had a little um, seminar back several months ago, and one of the things I said was when we rewrite, when you all help to rewrite the Telecom Act, why don't we call it something that nobody could be against, like let's make it the Jobs and Investment in America Act. You know, because isn't that what we're all really talking about, is jobs and reigniting an economic engine for our country. Yesterday, the statistic, and you all have all read it, we've dropped to 16th in the world in broadband deployment now. Um, you know, that's hard to believe for America every time I read it. In fact, I have to redo my speeches every few, few weeks because we drop another notch. You know, I call a staff person and say, where are we now? But I guess one of the things that I wanted to say was just to offer to all of you all in the room who are staff to um, our congressional staff that we want to be, each of us, every single commissioner across the country wants to be an honest broker of information for you all. If we can assist you all in finding out stats in your particular state, in your particular congressional um, district, that's what we would like to do because what we're really all trying to do is work together. This isn't for or against yes or no. This is that we've got to have some new policies for the future of this country. So with keeping that in mind, I guess I just wanted to make that offer to you and then also just just a few kind of broad remarks. One is, um, I think that we need, as we are moving forward, to really talk about a statutory construct that is based on principles and that is not tied to language, the whole concept of old words, old wires, old regulations. We still keep talking about the word telecommunications. We don't even know what the next um, platform or innovation or technology is going to be. So let's stop limiting limiting um, and make more flexible um, uh, how, we, how we are going to regulate whatever there is in the future. So I guess that's just watch the words and language that you all choose as you're drafting wisely. Build in flexibility that can survive longer than a few months or a few years. Um, it's also interesting that there are very appropriate roles for the states as we move forward. You know, a lot of you all know, many of your states probably, Tennessee passed a telecom act before Congress passed one. We passed do not call legislation years ago. Um, in fact, we decided not even to turn over our do not call list because when we asked the FCC and FTC, they were very confused about who would do what and who would respond to consumers. And basically, when we were talking told if we get a complaint, the, the um, citizen will fill out something on the internet, um, and we said, what if they don't have access to the internet? Um, and, you know, we respond to those complaints every single day. Um, in fact, to the tune of over 2,000 each year, which brings me to another um, point, and that is, do you want to build up uh, a complaining place, Consumer Affairs Division at the FCC, to take the 2,000 times 50 state complaints, and that's just at a bare minimum. Um, and for a very small state like Tennessee, I'm sure it's much, much larger. Um, so I think there are some things that we do well, and consumer education, protection, and outreach is one of them. Um, it's also interesting because I think that um, you know, we all have state authority um, that is, um, goes back to the original state police powers over the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. And so just because a company is someplace else in the country, you know, and they injure a, a citizen in Tennessee, that doesn't keep, you know, the insurance, banking, whatever, from, you know, getting involved in many cases. Um, you know, we've been involved in, in many of those. Just to give you, 
I'll give you a real specific example of our do not fax law that um, went into effect, I think it's been almost two years ago. We have Shop at Home Network, you all may have seen it on the um, internet, and uh, a fax blaster, I don't know, you know, these companies that are all over, in fact, lots of them are located beyond our borders, but started faxing, and because this company is so reliant on n numerous telephone lines, the fax started rolling to the next and the next and the next, and so it basically shut down the entire company. Well, if their alternative had been to call and complain at the FCC, I guess we'd still be seeking an NPRM right now to figure out what to do with that. And I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that, you know, that day we jumped in and got involved and, um, you know, got the company to resolve the problem. It worked out well. Um, the company also paid a big fine. Um, so in some cases, I think we do our jobs well. Um, but. You know, we do need to think about in incenting investment. I mean, I am concerned not just about the economic engine of our country, but the economic engine of Tennessee and more jobs coming to Tennessee and more new businesses. So certainly whatever we do, we want to do so that we're not stifling that new investment, but that we're encouraging it. So whatever scheme is going forward, you know, certainly I think we would all hope that we're not reimbursing people at less than what their cost is for for investments that they make in our state and in our country. Um, I guess the, uh, my, my final statement, because I know we need to move on, is just to keep in perspective all the IP considerations that we're talking about. It's exciting. The President has set this broadband deployment goal of all Americans having access. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but to broadband by 2007, and that would be wonderful. Tennessee was actually, we're, we're almost in every survey, 48th, 49th, or 50th, we always say thank heavens for Arkansas and Mississippi. But, um, you know, that's where we usually are. Incredibly, in hooking up our schools and libraries, we were number one in the whole country. I'm so proud of that. It was under my former governor, and um, while there have been problems with the E-rate system, they're process problems. They're problems that can be fixed. You know, they're auditing problems. Um, this isn't let's throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I just had to tell you all about Tennessee being number one in something. And so in keeping things in perspective, I guess my point is that while sure we hope every single American is going to be able to use, you know, IP technology and have all these fabulous <laughs> new innovations, in some states like Nebraska, almost 50 percent of the lines are rural LEC lines. These are people that, y'all, have a phone. You know, everybody in this room, hold up your Blackberry. You know, hold up your laptop. We all are connected in multiple ways, but we just can't lose sight of the people, whether they're in rural Tennessee and Appalachia or in North Dakota, that almost half of those people don't have that opportunity yet. So I think we have a long way to go, and while we're thinking about the future, and I'm encouraging you all to think about how you have a flexible um, set of rules, regulations, and policies, we can't forget that we've still got people that are not at that point yet, so there's got to be a transition for those folks along the way. Um, I'll, I'll stop my remarks and, and answer questions. Okay. Rick? Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, today. Uh, let me start off uh, uh, right at the bat here, um, agreeing with Commissioner Tate that uh, I think the title regulating the Internet is not necessarily quite apropos because I don't think that uh, state and uh, locals and even the feds do a whole lot of regulating the Internet per se. But I think the real question is the regulation of IP-enabled services, whether it's voice, video, data, whatever it is. So I'm going to focus my remarks a little bit on that. Uh, I want to begin by quoting from uh, our CEO at NCTA, and um, that's always a good way not to get in trouble. Um, and he was asked in an interview, uh, our new CEO recently came on board, Kyle McSlero, uh, former number two at the Department of Energy, and he was asked about our view of the 96 Act. And he said, our view is that the argument that the 96 Act was a failure is flawed. There's no American consumer today who would say anything other than we're better off today than we were in 96. Look at the services, look at the broadband deployment. 
The American people are smart. They understand because they're living it right now. They have many more services for less money, greater variety, greater choice, greater control. Whether or not all of that is attributable to the 96 Act is probably open to debate, but it's hard to argue that it's a failure. So that's the premise where we begin in looking at uh, the Act. And I know that, um, you know, particularly for those of you that live here in the, the sort of cocoon of Washington and have been exposed to uh, some of my friend Ed's uh, $40 million uh, ad campaign about the act and uh, that it needs to change. Um, but our view is that, you know, a wholesale rewrite is not what is necessary. Now, we recognize that, you know, there may be in the context of IP voice or IP video some issues that uh, raise some additional questions and may not be answered clearly by the existing statutory framework. And so it's perfectly appropriate for Congress and the FCC to go through the various proceedings necessary to understand the issues and, and do what's necessary as a result, but we don't think that translates into wholesale uh, changes in the Act. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the framework that I believe, or the prism perhaps, that all of these things uh, should be viewed through, whether it's voice, video, data, whatever it is. And some of you, this is, I guess, shameless plug time. Uh, some of you may be familiar with our NCTA policy paper issued in February 2004, and this was about uh, VOIP in particular. It was called Balancing Responsibilities and Rights, a Regulatory Model for, faci for Facilities-Based VOIP Competition. And the key there is the balancing of responsibilities and rights, or rights and responsibilities, uh, you know, depending on your emphasis. But the point is, what we said in this paper, and continue to believe, and this was mainly about voice, but also applies to video, was that there are certain core responsibilities that any um, that any service provider ought to meet. And in the context of voice, that meant access to E911, it meant uh, working with law enforcement, it meant providing access for the disabled, uh, participating in universal service, uh, compensating where appropriate uh, other network owners for the use of uh, their network, otherwise known as intercarrier compensation. So there are certain core responsibilities on the voice side. Similarly, there are certain core rights that should come along with that. One is the right to interconnect, the right to get numbers, the right for liability protection in the context of E911. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but that was the basis for what we did here on voice. Similarly, one can look to the video side, and this is where, to some extent, the uh, local regulators come uh, a little bit more into the picture than perhaps on the voice side and ask because, you know, we have heard quite a bit um, recently especially uh, about uh, video and how IP video ought to be treated in the future. And first of all, our, our view on IP generally is that it certainly uh, enables uh, providers to go out and get into the business, whatever it is, voice, video, whatever, more quickly. But it's not a, a magic bullet, something touches the internet and therefore is inviolate and, there, and, and, and uh, no possibility of regulation. Um, in fact, what we've seen in terms of IP video seems pretty squarely uh, like what cable is offering. But, you know, we're getting sort of mixed messages because I know that uh, uh, my friend Tom Talkie from Verizon addressed uh, some of uh, Cheryl's constituents, uh, the, in this case the mayors, uh, recently and said it's not logical to treat different sectors of the communications marketplace differently based on what technology they use when they're all delivering the same service. And we would subscribe to that as sort of a, a core principle, kind of treat like services alike, whether it's voice or video, uh, we have tried to make that point clear. But on the other hand, uh, for those that have been to a couple of the recent hearings on this issue, there seems to be a lot of discussion about the idea that franchising, uh, which, you know, again, uh, Cheryl is going to make her own case here, but, um, but you know, that, that franchising 
uh, is something important, but some new providers are trying to get out of those various responsibilities. And certainly you can look at the current law, and then you can talk about uh, what ought to happen in the future. But when you're talking about what ought to happen in the future, we've got to go back to our prism about this core responsibilities and core rights. And what are the core responsibilities at the local level? Uh, one of them certainly is that local communities ought to have the right to manage their public rights of way. We may disagree on how much we ought to pay for that privilege, but nonetheless, um, communities ought to have the right to manage their local rights of way. There are important questions about localism, important questions about um, uh, the carriage of broadcast signals. I mean, we could go through the list, but to simply wave your hand and say that franchising is, uh, you know, is not uh, an important um, uh, local concern and that there's a historical reason for why these various requirements exist is really, uh, I think, not the right way to look at um, uh, either the future or past services. So uh, let me just make one point about uh, state regulators. What we view the, um, the important role of state regulators in particular is to oversee carrier-to-carrier uh, activity or carrier to carrier disputes uh, because we don't believe, certainly the FCC has some expertise, uh, they have some resources, but the idea that with every uh, situation that you've got a problem that you're going to run to the FCC uh, is I think just not that um, um, credible and states have resources, they have expertise, uh, they know what they're doing in this regard, so we think one of the important core functions for states would be overseeing carrier to carrier interconnection. So like services alike, rights and responsibilities, and state oversight of carrier to carrier activity would be our sort of three uh, uh, goals and appropriate framework for viewing these services. Uh, Hi. Thanks. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk today. I pass on the regrets of uh, Mayor Fellman, who was testifying before the House yesterday. We would have liked to have our, our mayors here, but uh, we weren't able to do that with the timing of this panel. I wanted to let you know the League of Cities represents 18,000 cities across the country. We represent local elected officials. These are mayors and city council. The important thing, I, first I'm going to start off with, you know, what are, the, what are the thoughts, what are the issues that are driving cities, and then talk, you, talk to you about three requests that me, we specifically made of, of Congress and of the House Committee yesterday. Uh, talk a little bit more about those. I think it's important to remember that Local elected officials embrace new technology. They want new technology. Local governments are huge users of technology. They purchase this technology, so they are rapidly moving to using these Internet-based services themselves. They're looking for economical means to use them, so they, they are looking for this technology. They receive the same pressure as federal elected officials from constituents, small businesses, and big businesses to get this technology out there. So I think wanted to make clear how, how you know, our members and our mayors are very, very interested in moving this technology ahead to meet both their political pressures and their own needs. Cities, I think like everybody here would agree, want to treat like services alike. Therefore, neutral government regulation, f services that are faced, that are viewed as similar by a consumer should face similar obligations and similar uh, benefits from, from government entities, including local government entities. One approach that has been discussed, as, as Rick mentioned, has been an IP-only approach. And that sounds more like a, not technology neutrality. That sounds like technology offered on the Internet, whether it's tradition, analogous to traditional voice service, is going to be given one set of treatment, whereas technology that doesn't use the Internet would be treated differently. And that is not technology neutral, and I think that's going exactly against all of the things that we have learned from the Telecommunications Act thus far. The final driver is federalism and localism is clearly a historic part of our democracy in this country. And importantly, many local elections rely on video communications right now. People need those access to their local elected officials so they can vote in their city council elections, so they can vote for their mayors. They need that information. And so there's one reason, core democratic reason, why I think video programming in particular is, is very important and, and very local. And historically, our policies across the board uh, for uh, have supported local video 
regulation. As I mentioned, uh, Mayor Fellman from Arvada, Colorado testified on behalf of the League of Cities and uh, the technology advisors to, to elected officials yesterday. I also want to let you know that I have some information out front, not everybody got it, describing what he said yesterday, and obviously I'd be happy to give everyone a copy of his testimony. That'll be on the, the League of Cities website momentarily. I think some information is already up, and that's www.nlc.org if anybody's interested. So yesterday, what did we ask Congress? We asked Congress to take a deliberative approach as it considers the appropriate scheme for addressing IP services. We think we need a deliberative approach because I think we all would agree that last year, we looked at voice over internet services and we thought, oh, well, this is great. We'll just deregulate all these voice over internet services. There's no need to do anything. This year, we're hearing chilling testimony in front of the House Commerce Committee that there are people in their house with gunmen in the basement and they can't get to 911. This is clear evidence that we need to think about this. We need to think carefully about these social obligations before we just move ahead. And it's important to go through that process. Second, we ask Congress to recognize local government's inherent police powers over its rights of way. There's two core parts of this. First, the, the um, first part of it is local governments making sure that they can take care of safety of the physical space. It's not just telecommunications uh, companies that are in in the right-of-way. This is gas, electric. You have a real potential for danger, and local governments have very clear rules and guidelines and standards that they follow to make sure that we don't get exploding manholes, uh, you know, gas leaks, floods, and, and that's critically important. And I don't think Congress or the FCC or anybody else is going to come and take care of everybody's sidewalks on Fifth and Main. It's just not going to happen. The second part of that is these are public assets. Local elected officials are acting as fiduciaries on behalf of the public. And in these times of, of rising budgets, local elected officials need to manage public assets extremely carefully and, and wisely. And they would be rightly criticized if they did not collect rent for those uh, for those uh, public spaces. And I think you know, when we talk about generally the obligation to compensate carriers for use of their networks, I don't see there's any reason why the public should be the only one offering things for free. And I note, for example, that the federal government charges for spectrum nowadays. Way back when, we used to give it away for free. Nowadays, we realize that this is a private sector business making a profit, and they have to you know, engage and in, in incur their basic costs for doing business. The final point that we asked for Congress to, uh, to take into account is just the neighborhood-by-neighborhood neighborhood expertise of local elected officials. One of the important roles that local elected officials play, for example, in video regulation, is to ensure ubiquitous deployment. Right now, cable is, is widely, widely deployed throughout the country, and that is because local elected officials said, wait a minute, what about the neighborhood on the wrong side of the tracks? What about these people who are, are a little farther away than you might want to uh, deploy your infrastructure? And made sure that over time, not instantly, but over time, that these networks were deployed. That type of knowledge and that type of negotiation and follow through and oversight cannot happen from Washington. And the reasonable you know, accommodations that might need to be made in terms of the times of deployment and schedules and things like that, that also can't be made in Washington. That's just too, too time intensive. There are a few other important things. I think we mentioned them briefly, uh, the public access channels, the government channels, the way that citizens, one of the only ways that you ever see a city council person on television ever is on a public access channel. And these are people who are controlling significant portions of our daily lives as, as, as citizens. So you know, I think those are, those are some, and there's, there's a lot more we can talk about, but those are some of the core things that I think we have in our social contract with, with video providers, and we think they're, they're very important. Thank you. Ed, if you could pass that. Sure. Going, going last has its uh, benefits and its liabilities. Um, one of the liabilities you've heard a lot, so I'm not going to belabor things. Uh, one of the benefits is you've heard what the others have to say, so you can comment on it. So I'll comment on it. Um, first of all, from our perspective, we represent wireline, uh, previously wireline telecom carriers who have been around for 100 plus years, ranging in size from uh, our chairman's, which has about 3,000 lines in Annandale, Minnesota, to uh, Verizon, which is you know one of the 10 largest companies in the United States of America. And these uh, people have decided that there is an opportunity for innovation, an opportunity to grow beyond the bounds that they have been uh, compartmentalized in by virtue of tradition, regulation, legislation, 
laziness, whatever. It's a new world out there. And as part of that new world, they recognize that it is in their enlightened self-interest to provide to consumers greater choice. Greater choice means that consumers ultimately drive the marketplace, not regulators, not centralized state planning. And that as consumers choose, there's a transparency. Consumers pick a service, they pick a product, they pick something, but they don't really pick, oh, I want wireline telephony or I want wireless telephony. I want to talk to somebody. And I think what we do is we make all this so complex. We, 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 we become experts in the arcane and fail to recognize that American consumers, are, and not just American consumers, consumers are pretty bright. They can deal with items in the marketplace. They can make intelligent choices. The key is choice. They have to have many choices. And we are moving that way. There is a convergence going on. We've gone from separate long distance and local and mobile and video and internet services to opportunities where a consumer can buy a bundle of services, of all distance, voice, by the minute, video packages, things of that sort. We've gone from a system where you had uh, a, a, a dial telephone and you had separately a cable box to one where you have Blackberries and mobile phones with messaging capability, email, video, computer for internet phones and instant messaging. And so as we move forward, it's not time to rewrite the 96 Act, it's time to update our telecom laws to reflect what technology can bring to bear. And so when the fundamental question is, why do we have to do it? I like to go back to something I saw 18 months ago at our trade show, where one of the chief technology officers of a large company took out his Blackberry. And he said, I can spend $1 billion and in one year bring to market a device like this, which when you're in your office, you put it in a cradle and it's a wireline phone. If you pick it up and walk around your office, it's Wi-Fi without hanging up or anything, you just walk outside the building and it becomes a wireless device. He says, yeah, I can push the stop button, I can push another one and download, he didn't indicate whether it was from satellite or not, I can, he can download CNN, record it on a chip and play it back later while I'm sitting on the subway going home. I can do this in one year for one billion dollars, but I'm not gonna spend a penny because I don't know how it's gonna be regulated. Well, I'm one of those consumers who would like to have that device. More than a year has elapsed and that device is not there. Parts of it are there, but the device is not there. And the reason is that the regulatory framework in which these technology companies operate is so encumbered by hidebound regulatory structures that have long outlived their usefulness it's time to update the laws to reflect what technology can bring to the consumer and ultimately let the consumer make the choice. Consistent, of course, with important social obligations and consumer protections. E911, CALEA, access for persons with disabilities, carrier of last resort obligations. These are important things, so we may, do not make light of them. But the fundamental issue is technology can bring us great choice and we as consumers are pretty bright. We can figure out what we want and what we don't want. Consumer protection is an important underlying component for all of these services and it should be, remain intact, but not down to the level of the micromanagement which threatens the delivery of these services. Thank you. Thank you very much. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I uh, begin questions and um, have a few to start the conversation myself, I should, in the, fear, in the spirit of full disclosure, I do something I didn't in the introduction, and it will help, I think, um, lead to my um, first uh, question for the panelists. Um, the, the, I, I should identify a little bit more clearly the um, trade association for which I work, the Computing Technology Industry Association, CompTIA, is often confused with other groups. Um, we are uh, actually the nation's largest computer industry trade association, um, but most notable because the bulk of our 20,000 uh, business members are the small, often called value-added resellers, or the small computer companies located in every village, hamlet, and town in the country 
who equip small business with computer systems. So the next time you go into your dentist's office or doctor's office or real estate agent's office and see the little uh, computer network that they have there, uh, keep in mind that that computer network was not set up by a multinational corporation with three initials or it wasn't set up by a huge uh, uh, conglomerate. It was set up by a small business um, that does computer network services and there are about 30,000 of these little businesses around the country and, and Comtia is, is the trade association that most represents um, that segment. So we as an association have a deep interest in the growth of, of internet and broadband um, services. Having uh, given that little bit of background, let me ask the panelists, if I can, to comment on one um, aspect of, of the topic that was only uh, tangentially uh, referred to. And it's an important one for all of us, business and consumers alike. Um, for, for very good reason, uh, most of the discussion of this panel has been on this topic of connectivity. Because without connectivity, you don't get content, and if you're not connected to um, the internet or any other network, uh, all the content in the, uh, in the world is irrelevant to you. But it, I'd, I'd like to invite the panelists if they have any comments, and, and Cheryl did offer one comment on, on content. She explained that local jurisdictions have an interest in the content uh, going over the networks because it's a way to give exposure to local government officials. But, but I think the real issue is um, from the point of view of content um, providers, um, uh, do they have a stake in this discussion? Um, how should content providers of any sort view the issue of um, municipal versus state versus federal versus no regulation at all? I think it's widely believed that there should be some regulation of content. Certainly there is such a thing as illegal content. Everyone would agree with that. Um, but illegal to who and under whose laws and, and so I'd like to invite the panelists if they, if they have a comment on the topic of content. It's the sort of hidden side of the discussion of, uh, of, of jurisdiction because if and when the issue of connectivity is resolved, the issue of content won't be very far behind. So I don't know if anyone would care to comment on that or not. Through the Internet, we have access to a tremendous range of content, and nobody's regulating it. Just today, I downloaded ESPN 360, which is basically a cable service, on my computer. My computer has outputs. It goes right into my television. This morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm watching ESPN from, my cable, from the Internet. Yesterday, I sat in my office and watched a hearing. It was C-SPAN. So content is essential. People want it. People access it. They hit the www dot whatever it is, and they get it today. I think that's a wonderful thing, and people should be enabled to get it without any intervening government authority other than, obviously, things which violate the law because they're, they're uh, uh, obscene, which is to the extent that that's prohibited by law. Things which are prohibited by law should, of course, remain prohibited by law. But I don't think there should be any intervening government authority who says that I can watch ESPN 360 if I live in Fairfax County, but I can't watch it in Washington, D.C., because some governmental entity says you can't have that. I'll, I'll quickly respond. First of all, I'm not aware of any governmental entity telling people they can't have ESPN. So just to be clear, mayors do not want to deprive you of ESPN. Um, I, I think the one, the one comment I'll make on content is that the um, – most of the, the government intervention, and the only one on the local level, is to encourage to make sure that there is additional content that's not otherwise available. Local elected officials are not trying to stop people from getting content that they want. In fact, local elected officials like government, like federal officials, are probably mostly asked to that by people who are afraid of getting content that they don't want. I mean, that's really the big problem that we have, you know, I think as uh, representatives of, of our great constituency. But we do take some action to try and make sure that the organs of local government are open to everyone to make sure that they can follow and make sure they hold those local elected officials accountable. But that's really, I think, the type of role that, that I, would, I would conceive of. Um, yeah, I'll just preface my comments by saying I am not a content expert, unlike Cheryl in her previous job, who is a content expert. But, um, but I, I think one thing we haven't talked about is the sort of finely crafted balance in existing law and presumably future law between content owners and distributors 
and all of the, you know, the Grokster type issues, the intellectual property issues, which we're not here to discuss. I mean, I think your original question was, should these people be at the table? And, you know, I don't know that the Telecom Act is necessarily a vehicle for what's going to happen in regard to, uh, you know, protection for content owners in terms of file sharing or platform distributors. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. I would certainly advise them, I guess, to keep track of what's going on. But I did um, uh, reference something earlier that I'll follow up on, and, and uh, I do agree with Ed that there should not be um, a, a lot of content regulation or that, uh, you know, if ESPN is making their service available, you should be able to see it anywhere. But, um, but there are special rules in, for broadcasters. and. Um, you know, far be it for me as the cable guy to be shilling here for the broadcasters. Uh, after I was shilling for the cities, I'm taking everyone else's role here. But, uh, but you know, there is a uh, some exclusivity rules, for example, just at signal rules, so that uh, you know, I, I think to make the broadcasters' argument, it's about local ad revenue and such, so that. Uh, you know, if I'm not uh, out in uh, rural Colorado, let's say, um, that I, I'm getting my local station instead of the station from Chicago because they want me to see those local Denver ads or whatever it is. So there are those kind of rules that apply on the broadcasters that apply to us and what we carry and to the satellite guys. And one of the questions that certainly SBC's, uh, you know, IP video product um, raises will be uh, in terms of the broadcasters, whether those kind of exclusivity restrictions uh, apply, because I imagine the broadcasters will put up a fierce fight if, uh, you know, if SBC comes in and says they're going to import distant signals without any, you know, paying any fealty to, uh, to these kinds of rules. <coughs> um, let me open the floor up to questions then, if I can. As I indicated at the beginning, if you have a question, um, if you would stand and um, introduce yourself, um, they'd be most welcome. Right here, please. Roy Mark, Internet News. I suppose I have two quick questions. One from Mr. Tate. Last year, Tennessee, Senator Alexander, was one of the leaders in uh, stopping the notion that all Internet connections shouldn't be, should be tax-free. And so that really sort of brings the question down, how much of this is an issue about tariffs and taxing as opposed to protecting citizens? And for Ms. Leanza, she brought up the issue of 9-11 and the chilling story out of Houston. Uh, if a company like Skype, for instance, I read their end user agreement, and they specifically say, we don't provide 9-11 when a Skype call goes out to a traditional phone line. Should states require companies like Skype to say, we're not even offering 9-11 our service. Uh, let me repeat the question before you answer it for the, for the record. Um, Roy Mark from Internet News um, asked Deborah to summarize it, uh, whether this really was all about taxes or how much this was about uh, a, a debate about taxes and, and revenue um, for state or, or local governments. And, and he asked a question of, of um, Cheryl, w whether the um, can the states impose uh, at the state level 9-11 uh, or other uh, similar types of safety services on uh, VOIP um, service providers? I'll actually invite, uh, I mean, I'm happy to respond to parts of those questions, I'm happy, but I'll invite Commissioner Tate to uh, respond to the state regulation. Let, let, let me also emphasize that whenever a question is asked, every panelist should feel free to um, comment on it as well. So since the first one was uh, directed to uh, Deborah, let me ask her to. Um, first of all, I think that um, Senator Alexander is in such a unique, um, as are many members of Congress who have served as um, a governor of a state and a CEO, basically, of a state, especially one that is as poor and rural for the most part as Tennessee. Um, and if you followed our, you know, budget um, over the past few years, it has been very dismal. After I left the previous governor's um, office, there was actually a, quote, tax revolt brought down by DJs all across the state where hundreds of Tennesseans 
most of whom would have never been touched by a tax that was being proposed, were um, becoming so violent that there were address there were arrests and actually um, rocks were thrown through our governor's office window. So it got pretty violent and serious. I'm just trying to lay out how serious the problem is for the state. There are some estimates that um, there would have been an immediate $80 million loss and up to $360 million was the, um, last, the last time that I talked to the Commissioner of Revenue. All to say, isn't everything about taxes and subsidies up here? <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, intercarrier compensation, E-rate, um, universal service fund. I mean, let's just get down to it. I mean, these are these are technical, deep, uh, deeply divisive, and um, very uh, confusing systems. But in the end, it's about who pays who what. And, you know, there's going to have to be an awful lot of discussion. There are, um, we just in inside NARUG, we have a task force of commissioners trying to come to um, some even just suggestions about intercarrier comp, for instance. And at this point, we don't really have, you know, a specific formula or something that I can, you know, disclose. But anyway, back to your specific question. I mean, um, I think one of one of the other just kind of practical things to say is how could you have anything that was permanent when we don't even know what is going to happen in the next few years? I mean, that's just a practical way to answer your question. Um, and so I think that was one of the points that um, Senator Alexander was trying to make. I, I do think that he was also um, uh, being, a, being a very strong supporter of our state and our state budget. However anybody in this room may feel about taxes, it would have been a big hit um, immediately. Back to the uh, E911 issue. Um, this is actually something that Tennessee did well too. I understand that we, our phase one deployment was one of the um, first and our phase two has been. At the same time, um, we still have a county, I just heard this uh, uh, example the other day where there's no E911 service um, from wireless carriers. Uh, there seems to be just an issue about trying to make that happen. It should have already happened, and so the um, E911 board is working through that. Um, it seems as though part of this issue is going to get taken care of. I believe that um, it's already been in the trade press that Sharon Martin plans for this to be on the May 16th right. uh, meeting at the FCC. I would assume that that indicates that he will be at least attempting to take some action regarding that. I, I don't know what what that will be, but you know I think we're all waiting to see what what he is going to suggest about that. Um, Brian, am I correct that it's England that has just set aside an area code? We we were just reading an article about England where, interestingly enough, as you all know, this has gone from being called. VOIP to just IP, and in England it's VOB, voice over broadband. So, you know, every time that we come up with a term, you know, of art, it's already changed again. But anyway, so this is the way that England is dealing with this. I, we don't have the specifics of it. I just saw a blurb. I don't know whether it might be a possibility here or not, um, given the obvious difference in size of the country. But, um, you know, obviously other countries are looking at these same issues. And I'll just respond quickly. I can actually talk briefly about the internet tax moratorium because cities were very, very concerned about that moratorium and work closely with, with Senator Alexander. Think about it this way. Right now, you want to have your tax policy be neutral. It's a revenue-raising device. We all agree that federal government, local government needs to raise some revenue. Do we want to drive communications policy through tax policy, or do we want tax policy to be as neutral as possible? I think that when you start to carve out certain pieces of any industry and say, well, no, don't just don't tax this, just don't tax that, that actually inhibits the ability of local government to be more equitable and more fair among multiple different competing industries. I think we want to have that to be fair competition among, among many industries. And I think that, as we all know, so much of commerce, so much of all of our everyday lives are moving to the internet. Are we going to get to the point 
point where we want our property taxes to be so high because our sales taxes can't reach anything that generates revenue or is a building block of the economy. So I think the reason why you keep that moratorium uh, expiring is so we can consider it, continue to consider those issues. On the Skype question, I think that's why we're asking for a deliberative process. Obviously, Skype is a service that is, is basically free and mostly on your computer and not as similar to regular telephone to telephone service. So there may be some differences that are appropriate to treat that service. We don't have a position on, on that, that specifically. But I would say that's why we need to have a deliberative process. And perhaps it is the case that we need to have clear consumer protection warnings for services that don't contain those types of processes. I know that that was one of the problems of, of the family who couldn't reach 911, is that the disclosure hadn't been made to them. And in fact, that caused the Texas Attorney General to, to uh, go after them and to issue a broad warning. And there have been other local governments that have very aggressively warned their citizens to just make sure that they understand. It is absolutely, we encourage them to take these new services if they're meeting their needs for cost and the balance of what they're getting. But let's make sure that they understand they're not getting something that's going to reach the police at this point. And, um, you know, we, they need to know that. Uh, I'm sorry. No, that's a, it, we, we, we may need to mandate it at uh, many different levels. It may, be, it may be appropriate for the federal government to mandate it, some sort of 911 access, and it, it may be appropriate for states and locals to do that. But I think we are still in that process of evaluating, you know, what are the core goals. I think we've gone, most of the industries, uh, have gone really evolved a lot in their thinking in the last year to 18 months from realizing but absolutely upfront recognizing that 911 is a core service and CLIA is a core service. I don't think that was the case. And I think that as we continue in this conversation, we come, come up with more agreed upon consensus of where those dividing lines are appropriately drawn and keep them technology neutral. Um, well, I'm going to agree with Cheryl that it was not the case for those other providers, but shameless plug again, in our paper available at <laughs> www.ncta.com, uh, we had the tremendous foresight to answer your question. And what we did was, uh, first of all, to distinguish Skype and Xbox and other services from Vonage, cable provided VOIP, uh, VoIP services that the Bells might provide, uh, we devised a four-part test. And the three important parts of the test for your question are, does it use North American numbering plan numbers or some successor numbering regime? Does it connect to the public switch network? And does it represent a possible replacement for POTS? Vonage, yes. And number four, does it quack, quack, quack? Uh, actually, number four was, does it use IP from the end user uh, to the network so that you couldn't, uh, as Chairman Powell called it in a slightly different context, sprinkle IP fairy dust on your network and, uh, and claim that you're, you know, uh, uh, devoid of all regulation. But in any case, uh, Vonage would fit our framework and Skype would not. Maybe someday they will. Uh, so I think what's important, first of all, is to have a way. You know, we offered this test. We said this is a good test. Maybe there would be other tests. But the key is that you have some easy-to-apply uh, test that a, an investor that Ed talked about could look and say, gee, if I offer such and such service, I'm going to fall on this side of the line or I'm going to fall on that side of the line. So that's the, the sort of first important key is distinguishing among these various types of services because Xbox, you know, uh, we all know has a voice component, but most people I think don't believe that, uh, you know, your nine-year-old when they're slaying the orcs or whatever they're doing ought to be able to call 911 when they get in trouble. Um, <laughs> But the, the other point, in, in terms of the mandate, uh, we would argue that um, even though 911, E911 is a core responsibility as we lay down in the paper, that should probably be a federally um, uh, handled issue, which is not to say we've heard a lot of discussion lately about federal framework implemented by states or implemented by uh, local communities, depending on the specific issue that we're talking about. Uh, but to the extent there's a mandate at all, I would argue that that ought to be a federal rather than a state-by-state -state, um, uh, decision. Can I Please. Oh, sure, sure. Again, going last, and just because it's always nice to, I agree, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, other questions? Uh, right here, the lady. You. Uh, you introduce yourself, please. I'm Cheryl Bolin. I'm a reporter with BNA. And this may be a basic question, but it's one I hear over and over from industry groups. 
they all always say a patchwork of 50 regulations is terrible, destroy innovation, we can't function. What's, what's your response to that from the state level? You know, how, how, how can states still regulate and not destroy all I'm, I'm going to take that as a question to all of the panelists, and let me repeat it for the record. Cheryl Boland with uh, BNA uh, asked the panelists to comment on the allegation she's heard um, from people in industry that a patchwork of 50 regulations would be terrible and uh, not a good idea, and what do the panelists um, think of that? So um, you want to um, start? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, I really like the word tapestry better. <laughs> I told Brian I wasn't going to repeat that phrase again. Um, you know, most every business in America that's a, a national or international business deals with a lot of different jurisdictions uh, for a lot of different, you know, either federal, state, or local requirements. Um, we all do. Um, you know, I have property in different places, and so I deal with lots of different regulations. And so, I, you know, I, I guess that's kind of my response. Um, that if, if you want to do, I, I think there are very appropriate times, and maybe Chairman Martin is about to set forth a federal policy on E911, and I think we'll all cheer and be thrilled that someone has taken a stand and said this is the way it's going to be. I think there are very appropriate um, federal goals and policies, um, you know, and, you know, we always we want to talk a lot about how the information highway is taking the place of our interstates. Um, and, you know, so I think that there are some policies that may be much better to be set forth on the federal level. I also think that the states just have a historic and very important role in protecting the citizens that live within their borders. So it's, it's almost like this four-pronged test. I mean, they're just, they're just places when, yes, there should be a federal policy. We absolutely agree. Um, there's, there's a um, collaboration going on right now in the insurance industry where Florida, I believe California, and Texas are coming together under a cooperative agreement. And actually, I'll give it, I'll, I'll tell you specifically about this because I've got it somewhere here. Um, and what they are doing is so that, um, because they have a huge um, percentage of the insurance industry, and so they are going to have every single thing uniformly done. And each of those three states is going to accept all of this. You know, maybe we start doing that. I know that for um, Tennessee, after the 271 process, um, we, Florida negotiated a performance measurement plan uh, that has just gone through, and all nine Bell South states adopted it. And so it was total, total uniformity. We've just gone through an update of that. Um, Florida ha took the lead on that, although we, I actually opened a generic docket on it, and so have had some um, give and take with Bell South over the last few months. But from what I understand, Florida's now actually voted their commission, and they will be sending that around to the nine states. I would assume we'll all accept that. Um, uh, another just very simplistic example is when there's a merger or an acquisition or whatever and a company's changing names or whatever, both the FCC and all the states require that consumers are notified of that. You know, the FCC might say, you know, you only have to put the logos on the letter or something. Some states even get down to typeset. But when a company comes in and says, TRA, we have um, to send out these letters to five states or 50 states. Would you accept the letter that the FCC approved? I, I don't think that we have ever not done that. So I think whenever there's an opportunity, we're willing to do that. I think that's yet another way that you build flexibility in, um, you know, at different levels, uh, different levels of government. I think it's very important for you to have those people in front of you and say, do you plan to raise rates? You know, that's part of my job. And so, yes, I think they should have to come before us. You know, if we can waive our rule about a notification letter and send out the same one, I am all for the efficiencies of government. So I hope that's responsible. Uh, other 
comments from the panel on what Cheryl called a patchwork and Debbie called a tapestry. Please don't use that word. One last thing. Let me just say my disclaimer that I didn't say at the beginning. I'm so used to Anne Marie Kovacs doing this. But I'm just representing myself as one commissioner. I am trying to represent um, NARUG, a group of uh, commissions. I do not represent anyone else on the Tennessee Regulatory Authority. Thank you. Other comments? I'll comment on it. Yep. We've got to get rid of the patchwork. For, I mean, there are situations that I've heard of where a company wants to centralize uh, customer service responses, telephone banks, and depending upon what state the person calls from, the operator has to push a different button to find out how they have to answer the question in that state because the requirements are slightly different between state A and state B. So the customer service representative really doesn't become an expert anywhere instead of becoming an expert in customer service. They become experts in figuring out how to comply. And then you get situations where uh, this patchwork is not only a patchwork between states, which may be tolerable in some extent, but a patchwork between like providers. Give you an, uh, two examples. If Time Warner Cable in Atlanta decides to offer a $20 a month uh, telephone package and Bell South wants to meet it, it will take Bell South approximately 120 days to get approval to lower its rate. If, a, if SBC in Chicago wants to lower its rate for some sort of competitive reason by uh, $3 a month, uh, it will take a minimum of 45 days before it can put that through, which if only 35% of the people ultimately took this new package, $35 million in consumer value will have been lost due to regulatory interference in the marketplace. So I think that state regulation of the basic telephone service, as an example, makes good sense. The plain old black telephone that grandma needs. But when you get into enhanced services and this variety of different alternatives that the consumer can pick and choose upon, uh, both the patchwork as well as regulatory lag damage the consumer. Uh, yes, he may ultimately have choice, but uh, not in a truly competitive marketplace. If Bell South wants to lower their rates, I can assure you we'll make it happen more quickly than that. <laughs> you talk yeah. to Georgia, they put the state law for well, I, I just wanted to um, perhaps rather not the versus uh, patchwork versus tapestry. I want to use the word federalism. We have many laboratories of democracy in this country. We have developed a country based on 50 states. We are not for uniformity in our regulations, our local values, our local mores. That is not how this country runs. Nobody in this country wants Washington to dictate everything that's going to happen around the country. They want local people who are responsive to local needs to be to be addressing those things. Uh, I, the example that um, um, Mr. Merlis mentioned to me was, was particularly apt, I thought, because somehow these large companies managed to comply with all sorts of different complex uh, plans if you want to purchase your service. If they want to market to you specifically to offer you a special deal or a package, somehow their salespeople and their customer service people, you know, are, they're willing to impose those complicated burdens. And as anybody who's tried to figure out their plan with their customer and figure out if their plan is the cheapest plan for them, you know that these are complicated. And somehow their customer service reps are asked to comply. But when you talk about making sure that, say, a city or a town that has a large number of people who speak Spanish make sure that they are going to get the, the the adequate information that they need, then it's off the table. That's too burdensome for Verizon, one of the biggest com companies in the country, to take care of. So I, I really, I, we first of all, so I don't. And first level, I don't find it credible. Second level, one of the things I did want to mention is that I think everybody agrees that to the extent that it can be administratively more simple, local government is absolutely happy to work on making sure that that's more simple. One of the things that we are doing is right now in an industry roundtable with telephone companies, cable companies satellite companies, internet companies, everybody you can imagine, we're all working together to figure out a, a way to simplify and make more sense of the current telecommunications taxing regime. And that's very important. Uh, local government takes that very, very seriously, and we are willing to sit down and talk about it. But I think we have to put in perspective the types of burdens that we're discussing. And I mean, for I just have one other, more example is that often businesses say, well, let's just get routine cut, you know, consumer protection rules. We don't need anything special for telecommunications. But we have different consumer protection rules in 50 states in this country. And they manage, and they say that's what they want. But those are different around the country. 
So I, you know, I think we have to we have to look at that some of those concerns with a little bit of a skeptical eye. I'm going to quibble perhaps a little bit with the the question, or maybe not the question, because a lot of people do talk about patchwork of regulation. But I, I don't think that you can just answer the question based on. Uh, you know, gee, we would prefer everything at the federal level or prefer everything at the states. Going back to my earlier comments, I think you really have to drill down and look at the specific responsibilities in this case and look at why such regulations exist in the first place. I mentioned that we believe that an appropriate role for state commissions is carrier to carrier oversight. Um, along the same lines, something that they probably should not generally be involved in would be end user price regulation, perhaps, again, the basic service, something like that. I do think that there ought to be some, uh, some ability for the Commission to entertain complaints about anti-competitive uh, acts or activity. Uh, certainly, I'm not going to begrudge the, um, uh, the incumbent some additional pricing flexibility. Uh, but, you know, some states have such things as win-back rules, for example, and there's a reason. You know, there's sort of a balancing between when you have access to customer proprietary information and they're calling up to change their service, uh, you know, you don't want the customer service representative uh, that very day uh, or that, on that very call, uh, you know, trying to uh, sell them to stay rather than switch uh, because that's um, – that in and of itself is anti-competitive. There are some rules about that today. You know, how closely they're followed, I don't know. Uh, but, um, but again, I think you need to look at the specific activities of each uh, um, branch of government or what is the appropriate role. You know, as a general case, you would say at the state level, less economic regulation, but perhaps more of the uh, uh, whatever we would put into this competitive category of no anti-competitive acts, carrier-to-carrier -carrier oversight, those kinds of things where the competitive market is not going to take care of itself, particularly carrier-to-carrier -carrier because there is not, uh, I think we all know, a, a competitive market to, for sort of interconnection um, necessarily. Finally, let me just mention some of the state uh, telecommunication DRAG bills that are out there and distinguish. Uh, between some of the bills that uh, Quest, for example, has been pushing and those that SBC has been pushing. And Quest has managed to pass bills this year in Utah, Idaho, and Iowa. And uh, SBC uh, looks like they might pass one in Missouri, and we'll see in, in other states. But the big difference is that in every case, in the Quest bills, there was a backstop, if you want to use that term, that said if things get out of hand, the Commission can step back in. And they're all a little bit different in the way they're phrased, the way they're worded, and how they would operate. SBC's bills, though, would basically gut the Commission's authority, say that uh, you can't do anything, uh, you know, other than uh, what the Feds do. Um, it, you know, uh, and, and that's a big difference, I think, um, in looking at uh, when you do allow this additional flexibility or change the rules, is there a way to put the egg back together uh, if necessary? And, you know, SBC apparently doesn't, uh, you know, want the commissions to have that authority. Quest has been a, a little more reasonable to their credit and said uh, we can live with that because we don't think it's going to be a problem. Can I just follow up on that one point? Tennessee, actually I'm feeling much better about my state today, so thank you all for having me. But our, our legislature, um, as part of our original Telecom Act, built in a way for Bell South to deregulate services. And um, they had not taken advantage of that for years. I mean, when I came to the commission, I was kind of shocked that they hadn't filed. Since then, they have um, filed a couple of petitions to de deregulate some business services. Our legislature also had this backstop provision where um, we could limit the, the services that were deregulated, some or all. We could put conditions on them, and they could have been uh, geographic areas, you know, based on uh, market conditions and then also allowed us to, we're going to have them come back in and show us some data in a year after deregulating some services. So I thought that was very visionary and forward-looking, even though it hadn't been taken advantage of until recently. Um, thank you. Other questions, I think, over here. You, um, would you identify yourself, please? Thanks. I'm John Windhouse, and now I'm an independent consultant. 
Um, I uh, would like to come back to Commissioner Tate's uh, statement early on in this session that the United States is 16th in the world in broadband deployment. And with all due respect, that's not quite right. But the report is that the United States is 16th not in broadband deployment, but broadband subscribers. Actually, the United States has a very uh, pretty good build-out of broadband. Uh, I think over 90% of American homes have access to broadband today. The problem is that not only 25% of homes subscribe to it, and that's where the United States is falling behind the rest of the world. So um, NTIA and President Bush have said that one of the big reasons why we're behind is because the prices aren't low enough. Broadband's too expensive here. Uh, it seems to me you could get prices lower either by regulating them or by promoting more competition. I think we'd prefer to see more competition. And um, my question is, how, uh, what suggestions do each of you have for members of Congress about how to take steps to promote more competition? Let me uh, repeat the question. John Windhausen, who is a consultant, um, uh, pointed out that uh, the issue is not the issue in the United States is not broadband uh, deployment, but rather broadband subscription, which he attributes at least in some part to price. His question is, how can we uh, drive the price down, presumably to increase subscription levels? And his theory is that competition would do that, and he's asking the panel. To, to comment on how can uh, competition in broadband be increased to drive price down and increase subscription levels? I have, I have a quick answer. The first quick answer is that the uh, we want more head-to-head -head facilities based competition and the way that we can do that is make sure that entrants who are coming into the market are fully deployed throughout the country that every single home does have access so that they have a choice so that if one company is too expensive they can move to another company and they're um, they, they have a choice and I think one way to do that is when local government is there to ensure you've got deployment in every single neighborhood to every single house and multiple it just doesn't this problem does not go away just because there's one wire there needs to be two three four five other comments on competition? Um, we have a broadband bill going through our state legislature right now, and one of the um, starting points of that bill was to even find out where is it, which goes to your point. Now, is that based on that census where if there's one person that has access in the zip code, then that zip code is counted, and that's how we got to the 90 percent, because 90 percent of Tennesseans don't have access unless you call from their home unless you call it because there's ex because the schools are hooked up. Um, so one of kind of my one of the starting points of both what what our legislature wants us to do and what we want to do at the TRA is find out exactly what is going on in our state because there hasn't been a comprehensive study. I actually think that Nehruk did a study that Lila Jaber out of Florida worked on maybe several years ago, um, but it hasn't been updated through her uh, Joint 706 board. And I actually was appointed to that, and we haven't had a meeting, but I'm hoping Chairman Martin is is going to follow up on that. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, more regulation is very unpopular. Uh, you know, having the government get involved in deployment is very unpopular, but the states that are all, I mean, the countries that are all above us, I mean, that's precisely what's happened. So um, don't have a um, answer, but am willing to be a cheerleader. <laughs> Other comments on the question of competition? Just a couple of Quick comments. Uh, certainly, we uh, encourage and look forward to more facilities-based uh, competition. Um, I, I would argue that I think the 90 percent figure is probably correct in terms of number of um, uh, the population that can be served. It may not be, you know, in a rural state in Tennessee that 90 percent of the areas are served, but based on where people actually live. I think 90 percent probably have availability from home because we alone in the cable industry have invested uh, about $1,300 per subscriber, a total of about $95 billion since the 96 Act, and we have made cable modem service available to 85 plus percent of the homes uh, in the country. So when you add DSL, where we don't overlap, I think the 90 percent figure is probably pretty good. But in terms of your question, and by the way, I, I absolutely agree with your premise that 
there is too much of a fixation on where we stand in terms of broadband penetration as opposed to deployment because I think there are a number of factors that explain penetration. Price may be one of them, uh, but I don't, I don't think it's the biggest. Uh, one of them is when you look at the alternatives in those other countries, many of them had metered rather than flat rate local phone service. So dial up was just about as expensive as broadband. So uh, the broadband, you know, value, uh, uh, broadband dial up value relationship uh, there may have been more compelling where many people here are happy. Certainly narrow band numbers seem to be going down, but you know, many people are perfectly happy with their, their narrow band. Also, we have a lot of people, this may be, uh, you know, let's take Japan for example. Uh, I presume that a lot of people there have broadband at work, but perhaps employers in Japan are a little bit less uh, sanguine about their employees uh, uh, playing around on the internet during the middle of the day, and maybe U.S. employers are not so strict about that. But but we have, you know, surveys have been done, focus groups, etc. There are a lot of folks that. I have broadband at work. Why do I need it at home, for example? There are still, you know, when you look at the um, PC population, the number of folks that have computers in the home, uh, the broadband penetration statistics look a lot better uh, because there's still 30 plus percent, I think, of the population that doesn't even have a PC. And in some cases, that might be affordability. In many cases, it may be they don't see the need. So, you know, I think there's content issues, there's this price value broadband narrowband relationship. Uh, a, a number of other reasons why uh, we appear to lag in penetration, but I think in deployment, particularly given that it's, at least in the U.S., been almost entirely, not completely, but almost entirely through private risk capital, uh, I think we're in pretty good shape. Other comments? Just want to, um, want to add, uh, John, you're right. It, it, the number I had is 92% of the population has access to at least one broadband provider. 62% of the population has access to at least two broadband providers. And with the continued investment of private capital and wireless technologies and the like, you know, it'll get better. But there are a variety of factors. Competition is the most important thing in so far as, or most desirable, but there are a variety of factors. People don't have home computers. They can't afford the home computer. They have access at work. There's a lot of reasons for it. Our goal is to build it out, make it available, and hopefully get customers. Uh, if there are no other comments on this question, I think we've come to our appointed hour. Um, it, let me ask all of us who have listened to the panel to thank our four panelists for an excellent conversation. Thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, Internet Caucus uh, event. Thank you.